Washington, D.C., despite its status as capital of the United States, was not immune from wretched living conditions for its inhabitants in the past. Other major cities also suffered overcrowding as a result of massive and rapid population growth, and, arguably, the history of New York and Chicago, for example, attract more attention both now and historically for multiple reasons. Not least being considerably larger in scale, Washington, too, was home to squalid living conditions for much of its reputation from the second half of the 19th century. Many of them African Americans, with some having fled poverty in the South for what was perceived to be opportunity for a better life. The slums of Washington were different in many ways to those of New York. Washington's large blocks on the L'Enfant grid layout allowed developers in the 1800s both to build grand houses on avenues for the wealthy and, at the same time, subdivide back lots into dirt road alleys of rudimentary dwellings for the poor. The alleys were predominantly occupied by black people, with white people living in houses facing the street. The housing found in the alleys was sometimes reasonably constructed, but oftentimes dwellings were low cost, small and little more than shanties that lacked even basic sanitation. Such working-class neighbourhoods, while similarly overcrowded, were a marked comparison to New York's huge purpose-built tenements, but Washington still had them too, hidden away from the main thoroughfares and reached by dark passages, cramped, filthy and dangerous. Crime, drunkenness and debauchery was the life that many people knew here, before early 20th century urban renewal led by Lady Ellen Wilson, wife of the 28th President Woodrow Wilson, consigned many alleys to history. Today, you will discover what conditions were like in, arguably, the worst alley in Washington at the turn of the 20th century. You will listen to the account of a newspaper reporter who makes a visit to this alley, accompanied by a police roundsman, for it was risky enough for a policeman to enter, let alone a stranger. Learn why, despite a vibrant community, it had such a bad reputation. Hear from the people who lived there in wretched poverty and find out about the criminal activity which made the alley so dangerous. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. What is the toughest slum in Washington? That is a question frequently asked and to which there have been varying answers. At least three of the police precincts of the city claim the distinction of possessing within their boundaries localities which are the resorts as well as the breeding places of more criminals and violators of the law than any other section of the city produces. Number four precinct claims and with the authority of a long and formidable record behind its statement that Willow Tree Alley, situated between B, C and four and a half and third streets in southwest Washington, deserves the distinction. Major Richard Sylvester, superintendent of police, was asked for an expression of opinion. Is it true, the major was asked, that Willow Tree Alley is the worst place in Washington, is the lowest slum in the city? The phraseology of the question was such that the Major did not care to give an affirmative or negative answer. The fact of the matter, he said, is that there is no such thing as a slum in Washington. The wording of the question was then changed. Is it true that Willow Tree Alley gives more trouble to the police than any other one locality in the city? was asked. Yes, he replied. I think the records of the department would substantiate that statement. But it should be realized that there is no place in Washington that is similar to the dangerous criminal sections of New York and other large cities. The District of Columbia is free from places where filthy and debauched people live, in other words, slums. One need but visit the various alleys and courts and compare conditions there with those which prevail in other cities in order to be satisfied on this point. Washington is a southern city, and the few isolated sections of it that contain settlements of black people who live in squalor and are frequently in the hands of the police 
present precisely the same features to be found in any other city of the South. The place, known to the police, as I said before, in the alley section of South Washington, and reports thereon which have been made to me by competent persons who have investigated the section, show that prevailing conditions are generally good, better in fact than could be expected considering the circumstances of the inhabitants. The next step in the investigation was a visit to the alley. As a preliminary precaution, the police station where officers patrolled the section was visited. The original intention was to go alone to the alley and study the situation at close range. The officers of number four did not seem to approve the wisdom of such a proceeding. On the contrary, they strongly advised an escort through the alley. After listening to their reasons, and particularly because of a heart-to-heart -heart talk with a bicycle policeman detailed to the alley section, the reporter cheerfully allowed himself to be persuaded, particularly in view of the fact that it was pointed out that the alley dwellers would not talk to a stranger. Under the guidance of an officer, on comparatively friendly terms with some of the noted characters of the alley, the tour of investigation was commenced. A census once made showed that in Willow Tree Alley there are 94 houses in which a little more than 1,100 humans exist. The alley forms a large T and has three entrances from B, C and 3rd Streets. The centre of the T is the particular spot where most of the serious disorders have occurred. Just opposite the entrance of the branch leading to B Street is the YMCA mission of the Zion Baptist Church, which is conducted by Rev. P. J. Mitchell. This little chapel occupies the lower floor of a very disreputable shack. Across the door is printed in striking type, Where shall I spend eternity? And below that, Jesus is mighty to save. Diagonally across from the chapel is the house of Laura Hopkins, well known to the police. It is to her that the first visit was paid. It had been explained to the officer that one object of the visit was to find out what the alley dwellers had done to their credit. The police records were a long and black list of their misdeeds, and it was desirable to ascertain if their bad record was in any way counterbalanced. This idea seemed to strike the alley dwellers in the nature of a new problem. This gentleman, explained the officer to Laura, has been told that you people in Willow Tree are the worst in the city. He wants to know if you have ever done anything in your lives that wasn't wicked. How comes you say we all is the worstest people? inquired Laura, indignantly, of the policeman. Don't you know them up in Laos Alley am a heap sight worser than we is? Can't be, Laura said the officer cheerfully. But never mind about how bad you are. What we want to know is how good you are. I just tell you one thing, said the old black woman. When any of us gets sick and dies, we don't ask nobody outside the alley to help us pay the expenses. And you policemen know dat. That's so, corroborated the officer. They certainly do pay doctors to treat the poorer members of the fraternity. And when one dies, they all chip in and pay the funeral expenses. How much did it cost you to bury Chapman, Laura? He continued. Laura debated for a minute. Fifty-three dollars, she decided. But we all had nine carriages sides de hearse and one hack full of flowers. Elijah Chapman, explained the officer swiftly, hung May 23rd, 1902, for killing Ida Birch. It was an affair. Laura was evidently not accustomed to dilate upon the good points of her neighbours and herself. By patient questioning she was induced to explain how funerals and other extraordinary occasions for expense are financed. It seems that when a death occurs, someone starts a collection promptly. The women coming home from a day out at washing or other work are approached and cheerfully contribute a large part of their day's earning. The young bucks give up whatever they have picked up around town that day. The manner in which the money is earned does not, of course, figure in the ethics of the case. During a single hour, these wretched people will make up a sum of forty or fifty dollars. Out of this amount, the undertaker is paid on the spot. If there is not enough money to satisfy him, a second collection will be made. If there is a surplus, it goes for beer, which is dispensed at the house of mourning. Acting upon a suggestion from the officer, Laura invited her guests inside the house. It is decidedly better than the average. The room on the ground floor apparently a combination of kitchen 
and parlour, there was in the way of furniture a wood stove and a smoking kerosene lamp. Moreover, a chair was produced from the yard, in which the reporter sat and wrote notes on the top of the stove. This move aroused Laura's suspicions. "'What's he doing that for?' she asked. "'Why?' explained the policeman to her. "'He is going to put in the paper how good you all are. "'I have told him that you have reformed "'and haven't done time for a number of years. "'I guess I had better not tell him.' "'And he enumerated some two or three offences "'of which Laura is accused by the police. "'Why don't you hush?' said Laura, "'apparently greatly scandalised. "'Don't you put that in de paper, boss,' she said to the reporter. "'He knows I don't quit all that scandalous carrying on.' "'But Laura's appearance is against her. "'Her face bears witness of the many fights in which she has played star roles. "'Her nose has been beaten well back on a plane with her face. "'She has a cunning look and decidedly shifting eyes. "'Another queen of the alley visited was Lou Blackburn, living beyond the chapel.' It was she and the Herbert woman who started the recent riot in which policeman Fletcher of the 4th Precinct was badly mobbed. Lou weighs more than 300 pounds. When she has been disorderly and the police decide to run her in, her scheme for resistance is like Br'er Rabbit's. She reclines at full length on the pavement and refuses to move. It takes the combined effort of four strong policemen to lift her and carry her to the wagon. Rachel Minor and Martha Booker were the next on the visiting list. These two, with the Blackburn and Herbert women, and Laura Hopkins, are the most celebrated of the rulers of the alley. They were one and all in form that the sentiment of the police was to the effect that their quarter was the very worst in town, and asked, How about it? Like Laura, they seemed stunned by the suggestion that there was anything in their lives to redeem them from utter condemnation. By means of repeated suggestions, there were elicited many facts that deserve attention. The Widowites are as clannish as the Doones of Bagworthy, a family of outlaws in the famous novel Lorna Doone. Like the Doones, they resent strongly the intrusion of a stranger into their settlement, but among themselves is a remarkable sense of generosity. Not only do they bury their dead without assistance from the district government and provide medical attention for the ill, but if one of them is arrested and taken to the police station, the money to secure bail is immediately forthcoming. They go beyond that. Lawyers are retained to defend the serious cases, and witnesses can be produced to swear along any line of defence that is set up. During the intervals between fights among themselves, their relations are most friendly. Once a week there is a dance at Lucy Robinson's. The dancing floor is a room about ten by twelve in dimensions. The music consists of guitars, banjos and mandolins. The musicians receive no money for their work, but are plentifully supplied with beer. As the evening passes, the musicians become more enthusiastic, and the dancing is hilarious. A friend in trouble is the sole object of their attention for the time being. If one of them is sought for by the police, everyone is active in the attempt to hide him. If the officer is not known by them as determined and a successful fighter, the arrest of a member of the fraternity is a signal for a general attack by the entire alley. If the rescue fails, their next move is to take up a swift collection to bail him out. Their ability to raise money for such purposes is a constant source of amazement to the police, who are familiar with the lives they lead. On a quiet night, the aspect of the alley is peaceful in appearance, and it is hard to believe that the tales told of the inhabitants can be true. Little groups sit about the doorsteps, laughing and talking. Here and there is a group of The Boys, playing selections of popular songs on stringed instruments. At one end you will frequently find a capable quartet singing genuine melody. The quartet is made up of Robert Barnes, Charlie Harvey, Parse, Blackburn and George Edwards. Their fame extends beyond the alley. Crap games flourish at all times. During periods of great prosperity, the young bucks show up in the evenings with carriages to take the young ladies driving. So much for the good side of the alley. Acting upon the advice of the guide, 
The reporter decided to meet the two regular roundsmen when they turned in from the patrol box and have them accompany him on a midnight visit to the alley. Officers Kulanan and Halls of the 4th Precinct were on duty that night. They cheerfully agreed to make the round. The first place visited was a house near the B Street entrance. The police strongly suspect this shack to be a cocaine joint. But it has been impossible to secure evidence against the woman who runs it. If an alley dweller should give evidence against any one of the fraternity, he or she would be immediately ostracised, if a worse punishment was not inflicted. Consequently, a policeman cannot substantiate a charge. Moreover, if the woman should be arrested, there would be scores of witnesses to testify on her behalf. Officer Halls was well known to the proprietress of the place. She commenced to protest that there was nothing in her house that she was afraid for him to see. Who is upstairs? he asked. Tain't nobody tall up there except my sister. Well, can we go up and see this sister of yours? was asked. Yes, indeed, you can go right long up. I want you all look round if you thinks there's anything wrong about my house. In a miserable room at the top of his shaky pair of steps was found a pretty young mixed race girl about sixteen years of age, Asleep in a filthy bed, she appeared intelligent and above the average of the girls in the alley. "'What's your name?' was asked her. "'My name's Sally,' was the sullen response. "'How long have you been here, Sally?' asked Officer Halls. "'Come over to the light where I can see you.' "'Yes, you are new down here. Where do you live?' "'I live up End Street. That's where she lives,' confirmed the woman of the house who had followed upstairs. Officer Halls turned to her. You ought not to have girls here, he said. She is too young to be in a cocaine joint, which you know you are running. Ain't she my own flesh and blood? That's what I want to know. You police is always trying to give me a hard time. That's all right, was the reply, but you send her back to where she belongs. The next house visited was suggested by Officer Cullinan. He recalled that on one occasion when he had to go there to make an arrest, he found nineteen people sleeping in a single room. Ten by twelve feet. He had stepped over their prostrate forms with difficulty on his way to the adjoining room, where his man was sleeping. This hut was the filthiest in the settlement. The so-called beds were horrible beyond description. It requires a strong stomach and plenty of tobacco smoke to stay inside for even a few minutes. The bundles of rags on which children of all ages were flung in bunches must certainly be breeding places for filth diseases. This place was the first where there was an exhibition of dislike for the police, which was not concealed. You all will keep on butting in, said one of the women. Well, one of these days you was going to butt in for the last time. Her sentiment seemed to be shared by some of the others, although they remained silent. When you stop to consider the matter, it requires considerable nerve for a single policeman to plunge into a shack like this to break up a fight and make arrests. Officer Halls has a directory of the Willowites. He knows it by heart, and when a newcomer comes under his observation, he secures the name and takes a long and careful look at the face, as though to impress upon his memory. He has so arranged his directory that it shows more than the name and address of the people of the alley. Give him the name of any of them that has lived some time in the locality, and he will tell you something of his record and haunts. He greets nearly every one of them by name when making his round. The officers are particularly careful to keep within their rights. If they want to go through a house, they always ask permission from the owner, except in cases of emergency. The Willowites have a profound respect for both Officer Cullinan and Officer Halls. They have seen them under fire, so to speak. They have both been tried in the eyes of the alley inhabitants and have not been found wanting. It is said that a new man detailed to duty in the alley section stands a most excellent chance of being jumped the first time he gets inside. One of the things that impress one most among the scenes at midnight is the sight of men, women and children lying about the floors, sleeping in the clothing they have worn during the day. The utter absence of night clothes is not the most remarkable feature of their homes, but somehow it makes an impression. Then the way the members of the family are all piled into one large bed in some of the houses is a constant source of disgust. An investigation by the police once showed that in a population of a thousand, there were but five families that could boast legitimate marriages. 
while going through some of the shacks, lighting one's way with a lamp minus a chimney, which is typical of all lamps in Willow Tree Alley, it was often necessary to stoop down and grope away among the sleepers. In one house, a woman was sleeping on a mattress stretched across a passageway between two rooms. The woman of the house, who was showing the party through, calmly stepped across the mattress and over the sleeper. Her example was followed by her guests, who could discover no other means of getting past the obstacle. Not infrequently, one would step on the body of a sleeper, not seen in the dark. But even that did not seem to be sufficient to rouse them. Of course, many of the number had gone to bed stupefied by the amount of beer they had consumed. It was considerably past the midnight hour when the round of the houses had been completed. Late as the hour was, many groups were still sitting about the steps. They eyed the party as it passed, and occasionally some of them would mutter to the others that the man in plain clothes was the same one that had been there earlier in the evening, and they would speculate on the object of his visit. Just outside the C Street entrance, we passed a party of eleven of the young bucks. They were marching along in silence, and sullenly eyed the officers as they marched past. They swung into the entrance to the main alley without a sound, but the trampling of their feet. The officers remarked that they were specimens of the sports, who do not have to work. Their lady friends in the alley take in washing and support them in idleness. Members of the police force say that the alley is not a good place for a stranger to visit without adequate protection. They believe it is better than it was five years ago, but still consider it the worst section of the city. The assault upon Officer Fletcher is sufficiently recent to be fresh in the public mind. The fierce attack made upon him by the mob and the riot precipitated by the calling out of the reserves of the 4th Precinct show that the old spirit is merely lying dormant. The records show that there is not a single crime on the calendar that has been overlooked by these lawbreakers. During 1898 to 99, when detectives Cornwell and Bowers were doing a trick as roundsmen, they made 39 arrests in one night between the hours of 6 and 12. On one raid occasioned by a general fight, there were 17 prisoners piled into one patrol wagon. The fear and respect that the officers of the precinct have drilled into the minds of the Willowites is their greatest safeguard from assault and possible death. When a sudden burst of fury particularly inflames their constant hatred for representatives of the law, the situation becomes critical. Officer Jackson was attacked one night by a single buck and wishing to avoid the use of his baton or revolver, closed in upon him and threw him to the ground. The man was large and powerful and struggled fiercely. During the scrimmage, he managed to reach back and secure Jackson's revolver, and slowly but surely was twisting it back to secure an aim at the policeman's head. A man passing through saw the move in time to grab his hand and force it to the ground. It was not until he had ground the hand into the pavement with the heel of his shoe that the man dropped the revolver and allowed himself to be taken in. Ordinary penalties do not alarm these inhabitants of the underworld of Washington. To serve time is not a disgrace in their scheme of existence. Fifteen days is called sleeping time. Longer terms are simply called time. They have some dread for long sentences. After several months they pine for liberty and their former wretched lives. It was by the use of extreme penalties that Lao Sally was cleaned out. The majority of inhabitants of that court are now Italians, who give the police little or no trouble. Long-term sentences are helping the situation in Willow Trialli. The worst characters have been removed in this way. One of those who have passed on from the local ken is Bud Walters, as clever a second-story man as there has ever been in Washington. He was married to a white girl named Mamie Norbeck, who lived in the alley with him. At the age of 36 years, he had served 19 years in various jails and penitentiaries, allowing for time off for good behaviour. It must be understood that all the alleys about South Washington are not as bad as Willow Tree. The police have done all they could to alleviate the situation, and in many places have accomplished marvels. As Major Sylvester points out, you cannot help people who refuse to be helped. The paving of the alleys is excellent, and the drainage first class. There is none of the horrible filth and the gutters to be found in some of the cities. The houses are comparatively well built and kept. The squalid furnishings and crowded filthy condition are due to the people themselves. 
Some of them make good wages, but their money is spent for beer or in other unnecessary forms of what they consider pleasure. At the present rate of improvement under the police department, Willow Tree and Kindred Alleys will soon have lost their toughness.